Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this webinar on biochar and carbon dioxide removal presented by the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University. My name is Jason Funk, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm working with the Institute uh, and with American University as a fellow. However, most of my time is spent running something I call the Land Use and Climate Knowledge Initiative, which I founded in 2019 with the aim of promoting more informed, cooperative, and charitable solutions at the intersection of land use and climate change. My task today is to help all of you become more informed about the important topic of biochar. And I plan to do that simply by staying out of the way as much as possible, because we have an excellent lineup of speakers today. First, let me just uh, give a few housekeeping notes. All of you tuning in are muted and you'll be muted for the duration of the webinar and your video will be turned off as well. So in order to allow us to interact, we encourage you to write any questions you have into the Q&A tab, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen for the Q&A portion of the webinar. You can also feel free to use your chat box to submit comments or uh, maybe any technical issues you might have along the way. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Institute's website shortly afterward, along with many past webinars on relevant topics uh, concerning carbon removal. You'll be able to access, this, access these webinars at carbonremoval.info. Carbon removal is all one word with no punctuation or hyphens. And be on the lookout for our next webinar on December 2nd about enhanced ocean weathering and carbon removal. Today's one hour webinar will explore biochar as a carbon removal method. We'll start with three presentations from our panelists and we'll open up the floor for questions. On behalf of the participants, I want to thank our panelists today for taking time to be here for this important discussion. I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're expected to speak. I have to mention that um, one of our speakers has not yet joined the webinar, so we're not sure if he's having technical difficulties or not. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, our first speaker, though, who has already joined us is Johannes Lehman, who is the Liberty Bell, sorry, Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor of Soil Biogeochemistry and Soil Fertility Management at Cornell University. His specialization is soil organic matter and nutrient studies of managed and natural ecosystems with a focus on soil carbon sequestration, nutrient recycling from wastes, biochar systems, circular economy, and sustainable agriculture in the tropics, especially in Africa. The speaker we have slated to um, come up second is Darko Matovic, who is professor at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, where he teaches in the mechanical and materials engineering department. His research interests include sustainable energy from biomass and the production and use of biochar as a viable technique for carbon dioxide removal and as a valuable resource uh, material in soil improvement and remediation of contaminated soils. Our third speaker uh, on, our, on our list is Kathleen Draper, who's the board chair of the International Biochar Initiative and vice chair of the U.S. Biochar Initiative. Kathleen is the owner of Finger Lakes Biochar, which is focused on biochar activities in New York State, and she is the U.S. director of the Ithaca Institute for Carbon Intelligence, which has a global focus for biochar activities. She's a co-author of Burn, Using Fire to Cool the Earth, as well as Terra Preta, How the World's Most Fertile Soil Can Help Reverse Climate Change and Reduce World Hunger. So first off, uh, we'll have Johannes uh, give his presentation, and we're waiting for Darko to join. Um, if he's unable to join or joins late, uh, we'll jump straight to Kathleen. So for now, um, let's hear from Johannes. Take it away, Johannes. Thank you very much, Jason, for the kind introduction and, and moderating today. And thank you, um, Alison and uh, Union of Concerned Scientists for, for putting this together. Um, so I, I wanna share some, some uh, basic thoughts and then um, hopefully make them some salient points about biochar and, and the context of carbon dioxide removal, uh, as well as greenhouse gas emission reductions, because that, that plays a role in that discussion. Um, just as a preamble, um, so that we're getting on the right track in, in framing this, uh, carbon dioxide removal 
uh, really uh, makes only sense if, if there's a, a lot and, and sincere effort in uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel consumption. I, I think that's, that's something I probably we, we all agree in um, uh, and uh, that anything that we do, including biochar, is not a silver bullet, um, uh, but we need a basket of options and that we need to dip into. Uh, so that's that's sort of a wider framing um, to to um, frame uh, a, a discussion on biochar as a CDR. My initial motivation, and uh, I, I believe of inspiration for for many others in the last twenty years uh, for looking into biochar, is the uh, investigation of the so-called terra preta geo soils. These so-called dark earths um, in the in the central Amazon uh, have remarkably high carbon contents and are remarkably fertile. Um, we know that they have been modified by Amerindian populations uh, several thousand years ago, and they are unusually rich in what we now call biochar, uh, this pyrogenic carbon. Um, it is not really clear for all sites, uh, but highly plausible that these biochar amendments were laid down uh, on purpose for something that approximate agriculture, uh, but it is very clear that uh, they were and when and that they're still there and what effects they have. Um, so those, those are a remarkable motivation for looking into the persistence of uh, biochar in an environment where carbon cycles much faster uh, than these old C14 dates would be like. Another important framing um, is that biochar is actually not just peppered somewhere here and there in the environment, uh, but is ubiquitous in our soils, sediments, oceans, and the atmosphere, we have to say. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we're looking at um, a map here that you know, is, is, is still a work in progress in terms of assembling the global data set and, and there's much to be done, but it is, is blatantly clear that biochar is, is everywhere in soil. So what, what we're talking about is, is managing the Earth's carbon cycle uh, and the stocks that are already there rather than introducing a completely alien substance. So what is biochar? Um, biochar is the conversion of uh, of organic matter, such as here shown for corn cobs, um, under the uh, exclusion of oxygen heated to more than 250 degrees, 300 degrees Celsius, uh, at which stage uh, not only water evaporates, but uh, carbon is, um, is reconfiguring in so-called amorphous carbon and then above 500, 600 degrees uh, to an increasing extent in, in more ordered structures that uh, approximate something like turbostratic carbon. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen is volatilized. Carbon-carbon bonds form that are not usual in, in the biological systems because they are uh, difficult to make and difficult to break. Um, and and that's, that's part of the, the story. Uh, the bio, biochar as a product is actually also not new. Um, it has been around for a long time, uh, even in the com uh, commercial realm here from the 30s from the US. Um, but uh, in, as far as I can see from the first mentioning in scientific studies and textbooks and farmer outreach materials from the 1850s uh, up to several decades ago, uh, never really um, bothered in, in thinking through that there might be different charcoals, what effect they might uh, exactly have, and how we might um, uh, uh, manipulate and, and uh, manage it uh, judiciously. So that, that is really a, a new way of, of looking at, at charcoal or biochar. Uh, but I want to make very clear also that biochar is, we shouldn't think about biochar as, as a material. Biochar is really a, a, persist, a, a system, a, a pyrolysis, uh, or, or thermochemical conversion system, uh, whereby we need to look at all the moving parts in it. Uh, where's the biomass coming from? What is it? What properties does it have? Um, yes, what kind of biochar we are producing, but also what kind of gaseous uh, compounds and liquid compounds we, we might produce. Um, there is a large community and has always been a large community that is looking at the oils and uh, condensables as well as the uh, gases that are produced during pyrolysis. And some of the major chemical companies in the 1800s were actually pyrolysis companies that made all kinds of chemicals from, from uh, the gases and the liquids. Um, 
In terms of climate uh, mitigation uh, with biochar, I, I'd like to uh, distinguish between three broad entry points. Uh, one is, of course, when we convert uh, thermochemically biomass, we are generating energy, the, the, the gases, the, uh, the liquids, as well as heat. Um, and those can, under suitable conditions, uh, not always, um, but under suitable conditions, be transformed into energy that are uh, uh, potentially offsetting fossil fuels. The second one um, is, uh, is the one that is probably uh, central to this discussion is the carbon dioxide removal, uh, but also emission reductions. Um, because we are converting something that mineralizes fast, um, or relatively fast within weeks and months, uh, into something that mineralizes very, very slowly and does not emit appreciable N2O or CH4 emissions either. And then there's a whole suite uh, here under Sean on the Sea um, uh, of effects that pertain to the ecosystem. When I put biochar into a soil in, in this context that I'm discussing today, um, <clears throat> then uh, we, we can expect changes in greenhouse gas emissions from the soil, so not from the biochar that was added to soil, but from the, from the soil, uh, as well as, for instance, um, changes in, in uh, uh, photosynthesis um, uh, through, through greater crop growth. And, and those um, are, are uh, fluxes and balances that we need to look at um, separately from, from biochar or the fossil fuel emission reductions. Uh, so key for, for this, uh, to work is uh, the so-called persistence of biochar. Why it has this large longevity? Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this uh, fusing of ar aromatic structures and the carbon-garbon bonds into clusters that are not all that large, um, but sufficiently large that they are hard for biological organisms to break down. Uh, and that translates into one to two orders of magnitude lower mineralization in soils than we would otherwise have with the unpyrolyzed material. Um, and that's that's the key. It's not there forever, but the mineralization reduces remarkably. Um, and this condensation uh, means there's less hydrogen in there, uh, more organic carbon that is linking to other organic carbon. And this what's called molecular condensation um, with increasingly high temperature relates to um, higher mean residence times as shown here for a global data set uh, normalized to same temperatures and uh, um, across these, this property of uh, hydrogen to, to carbon ratios. And so it seems that, that the material property here um, has a, a, a direct relation with, with an admittedly large scatter, but there is a, a, a relationship with, with the persistence uh, in soil. And that can be utilized um, to uh, device uh, predictions and even as now shown in the latest um, IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas accounting, also a biochar method uh, that in this case translates um, of uh, the, the temperature at which uh, biochar is made to a, in this case, this, uh, these are F perms um, uh, fractions uh, as they're expressed in IPCC language uh, of how much there is still after 100 years. So at lower temperature, 65% still there after 100 years, going up to about 90% still there after 100 years if paralyzed above 600 degrees Celsius. Um, so these are opportunities for man monitoring practice of conversion rather than uh, only presence after a certain time. Um, so that, that, that is an opportunity that is, um, is interesting uh, if, if you're familiar with other CDR technologies um, uh, to look at. I've, I've so far only looked at, at, the, at the soil itself um, and the immediate ecosystem, but for a full life cycle assessment, we of course need to uh, um, consider also where the, the photosynthesis is happening at the front end uh, transportation and manufacture of any uh, equipment. Um, so there are, there are even more moving parts than I showed you earlier. Uh, these all have to be considered uh, to have any credence in what the emission reductions are or discount any carbon sequestration and CDR um, using uh, the, the total emission balance. Um, and, and some of the methods are already going into that direction. Um, some of those can be conservatively uh, ne neglected because in, in um, meta-analysis they have shown to be, to be a rather emission reductions and to facilitate 
uh, accounting um, that can in some cases be done, but one has to think through that very carefully. Um, a full life cycle assessment um, would look then something like this, looking at different uh, uh, biomass that, that can be uh, used here, um, crop residues as one broad category where uh, the, the, the growth of biomass is, is incentivized by um, another factor, in this case food production, or we're producing a dedicated material, uh, or it's only a waste product. Um, and, and you see um, that, uh, that the, the emission reductions shown here um, are uh, hovering around 800 for most of these systems, 800 kilograms of CO2e per ton of dry feedstock in. Um, with the exception of when we produce biomass dedicatedly, then we have to consider, uh, make some assumptions about indirect land use change uh, if that is needed. And, and you can see that that makes, uh, of course, a big difference. What I would also like to highlight here is that this blue part, um, that's the biochar that ret is retained um, in the soil. It makes up a large part of the emission reductions of the system. So obviously, um, the, the, the persistence and the sequestration and the CDR component uh, of the system makes, makes up a large part of the greenhouse gas emission reductions. In this, um, in this uh, calculation, uh, there, there is uh, no, um, uh, no account of any crop yield increase. Um, and in, under these assumptions, um, the uh, emission reductions achieved with biochar additions to soil are roughly equivalent to the emission reductions if that biochar was used for fossil fuel in, uh, offset uh, in, in, for instance, a coal-fired power plant. Um, so that means um, any, any uh, uh, management and any effects that biochar might have on soil and plants um, is the effect that tips the balance um, towards, towards uh, a biochar system having greater emission reductions in addition to carbon sequestration um, that, uh, um, than, than uh, using biomass for fossil fuel offsets alone. Uh, one assumption is, of course, that uh, for, for fossil fuel offsets to happen at all is that we can use it uh, in many systems, as you see here, the, fo the photo, um, that's probably not the case you know, for pine bark beetle kill or, or uh, forest fire management in, in uh, California. Um, it's hard to see that that always happens. So we need to be um, not on, about, I, I might make another point later um, about, uh, about farmers, but I, I would like to highlight that crop yield increases um, are probably a cornerstone of, of um, uh, biochar, um, biochar argument using it for a climate change mitigation and a CDR. Um, and, uh, and we're getting more confident uh, on a global scale to argue that biochar on average um, with large variation, and, and those are the ones that, that require um, site-specific management, on, on average um, ha has an increase in, in crop yield um, that is about the same increase that we see with inorganic fertilizer on these same sites uh, to begin with. Um, so, so we're talking about um, uh, almost doubling uh, yields compared to fertilizer uh, additions alone. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a significant increase. Um, what that means on a global scale, uh, looking at systems, greenhouse gas emission reductions versus soil carbon accrual um, or CDR portion of it, uh, and comparing biochar, which has a slightly higher um, greenhouse gas emission reduction than soil carbon accrual would belie because there are other moving parts in there, as I explained. Um, whereas uh, set aside such as restored wetlands are, are uh, possibly uh, having, uh, on, or at the moment, seem to have lower um, emission reductions than, than soil carbon accrual um, uh, alone because of some of the methane kickbacks. Um, and cropland sits somewhere in the middle. Um, so that, that's, that's uh, something to, to, to think about, but they're all sort of in, in the same order of magnitude. But the last but one slide, um, I would like to just highlight um, the fact that bioenergy systems uh, will always produce 100% uh, of the material or with some losses in there, of course, um, uh, energy, uh, a back system where we inject these emissions uh, into somewhere where they're hopefully not leaking, uh, would store 100% of the biomass carbon uh, somewhere. 
uh, whereas biochar sits sort of in the middle, producing half the energy and storing half the carbon. Um, so having to make an argument for only producing half the energy and half the carbon, we uh, either have to look at the specific situations where uh, this could uh, work, and, and we've made the point that um, the additional um, uh, revenues for increasing crop yields or the readiness, the deployability uh, are arguments, but also there might be a, um, an, a sort of geostrategic uh, discussion to be had where we want to put our arduously photosynthetically fixed carbon, aka plants, um, whether we want to produce only energy from that, where there might be other options to do that, uh, or we want to retain as much of the organic carbon that's photosynthetically fixed uh, in our terrestrial ecosystems um, to uh, improve, for instance, soil health. So with that, I'll, I'll um, some, uh, just repeat take home messages. There are some synergies between food production and, and biochar CDR, um, but uh, there's local optimization needed. There is a, a higher life cycle emission reductions with biochar than, than uh, just the uh, CDR portion would be lying. That is important, I think, uh, compared to, to um, uh, other opportunities. So when, when, when it comes to uh, allocating carbon in our environment, we should think about that. But of course, there are lots of moving parts. Um, and again, there's, there's a, a local optimization needed. Um, there's no doubt that there's a trade-off between energy and CDR, um, and we need to think through that, what, what's worth to us more. And with that, um, I'll thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Johannes. That was fascinating and uh, quite a bit of information packed in there. And I especially appreciate all the links uh, that you provided to show us uh, the literature sources for a lot of that material. So I'm going to go follow up on those later and check out some of those some of those citations. Um, we haven't yet uh, seen Darko join us, so we're going to go ahead and go uh, straight to Kathleen to hear her presentation. Uh, I already see some questions rolling into the Q and A. Um, so those of you who have already submitted questions, you'll be first up. And uh, anyone else who wants to submit a question, um, feel free to do so. If you're having any other uh, issues or just want to make a comment, you can also use the chat box. Okay, so at this point, I will turn it over to Kathleen. Go ahead. You're still muted at the moment. Uh, just go ahead. There, you, it looks like you're ready to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jason, Allison, and American University. Whenever I follow Johannes, I like to say, now I'm going to give you the layman version instead of the, the Lehman version. And a case in point here is how I tend to explain biochar. And you'll see at the back of this slide is, is a picture of burnt toast. And what, what I like to say is when you think of pyrolysis, it's basically similar to putting something in the oven cranking up the temperature, you don't get any real oxygen in there. But if you have it high enough, you can turn it into something that looks like burnt toast. And that is not a very, very appealing food source, either for humans or for microorganisms. And it also, you can tell, has a lot of nooks and crannies, which they like to uh, inhabitate. And uh, so I think, I think that's an, a quick and dirty way to think about what biochar is. But I was asked to provide a high level overview of the current state of the biochar industry, talk about some biochar markets and how to foster market growth, and then to touch on biochar and the carbon removal market landscape. I obviously need a little bit more than 10 or 15 minutes to do that, but I put more information in the slides than I'll have time to cover so that you can go back and look at that at your leisure. One second. There we go. Okay. So first, let's take a quick look at the biochar industry. Uh, and I will say that there is a market difference in the industry in different parts of the world. And the US is certainly not taking a leadership role from a, from a commercial perspective, but that may soon change. Uh, a few years ago, it could have been argued that the major constraint to growth was the lack of production technology. Now, however, we're seeing a growing variety of systems at all scales, and that includes backyard kilns, mobile units, modular systems, decentralized mid-scale, industrial scale that are centralized, and there's even a big push, especially in California and the Pacific Northwest, 
to retrofit existing biomass energy plants to optimize biochar production. So I, I thought Darko was going to talk about the different types of systems, which includes pyrolysis of many different flavors. We have slow, fast, flash, and even microwave pyrolysis. And gasification can also produce a certain amount of uh, biochar if they're operated right. But I did want to mention that sometimes people confuse incineration with uh, other thermochemical conversion properties, but we do not consider that as one of the technology that, that produces biochar. So the resulting biochars vary, as Johannes mentioned, in physical, chemical, and biological properties, and can now be found commercially available in most parts of the country. You can see them for sale at Home Depot in five gallon buckets, or they're sold in super sacks, or even by the truckload, either as a pure biochar or more commonly it's blended with compost or other additives. Everyone's always asking about the price of biochar, which I will say varies a lot depending on the quality and several other parameters. One thing to note though, is that the price of biochar is falling as production increases, which I believe is a good thing both for the industry and the end users. At the last count, the U.S. Biochar Initiative estimated that there are approximately 150 biochar producers. Most of those are on the small scale, uh, and overall production is still probably below 100,000 tons per year, but it is ramping up. The ecosystem of biochar producers has been evolving from the pure biochar producer model to include those in the biomass energy sector. So that includes not just those producing the energy, but those producing the feedstock for the energy production. Those are in the torrefaction industry. And then we have a variety of players in organics management, including composters, the construction and demolition recycling industry, and more recently, at least in the US, we have wastewater treatment plants that are converting uh, sewage sludge into biochar. And we also have farmers, foresters, and land managers that are beginning to carbonize crop residues. The biochar industry has been changing rapidly a lot in the uh, last few years for many different reasons. I've just covered a bunch of the current strengths within the industry, but we do obviously still have some challenges. So to highlight just a few, I would guess that somewhere north of 90% of the population has still never heard the word biochar. At least that's been my experience. Another challenge we have is that although there are various standards for biochar, including one from the International Biochar Initiative, which covers biochars used in soils and in North America, then there's the European Biochar Certificate Program that has uh, certificates for used in soils, livestock feed, and composites these standards have not been well adopted. I do see that beginning to change as there's increased interest in biochar as a carbon removal product. Um, and there's also a lack of laboratories that are capable of doing the full suite of uh, characterization to certify biochars. Uh, we are still working on that, but it's been a challenge. I would also say there's um, a need for some unbiased educational materials about biochar for different audiences, including policymakers, biochar manufacturers, and then the various different end users. One of the positive things we've seen since the pandemic, though, is that there are a lot more biochar-related webinars offered by different groups, such as American University and the U.S. Forest Service. The opportunities to scale the industry are growing uh, especially since we have this increased interest in biochar as a carbon removal market option. As compared with some of the other negative emissions technologies, biochar offers a number of different co-products, as uh, Johannes mentioned. Those include heat, which can be converted into electricity. Uh, we have syngas generated with certain technologies, bio oils, and even wood vinegar. And if those co-products can be monetized, then the price of biochar can be reduced. So biochar has been recognized by the Association of American Plant and Food Control Officials, or APCO. And most biochars can be certified organic by OMRI. There's an exception when it comes to manure biochars, but we're working on getting that updated. Uh, and very recently, this year in fact, the USDA, National Resource Conservation Service, 
has uh, deployed what's called uh, Code 808 or a soil carbon amendment, which is focused on providing funding to farmers to increase soil carbon specifically using compost, biochar, or a combination of both. And we just heard a week or two ago that at least in New York State, one of 10 states that have adopted it, they would pay farmers up more than $800 per acre for adding biochar. And, and the price points are different when it comes to blends or compost, but that's a, that's a pretty big incentive. One of the more recent and most hopeful opportunities that I've heard about is that there is actually a biochar policy task force on the Biden transition team. So if any of you have any thoughts on what policies could help scale this industry, please let us know. Uh, the industry is not without threats, of course. Uh, although most biochars look pretty similar, they are actually very different, as I mentioned before. And this has led to some serious overselling of the benefits of biochar for specific end uses. There's this tendency to claim that a specific biochar can do everything ever claimed in the name of biochar. And we have learned to our detriment that that's just not the case. Uh, one concern we hear a lot about is that biochar will kind of follow in the footsteps of ethanol in terms of the food versus fuel dilemma. In this case, it would be food versus feedstock. I, I would say that until the carbon removal revenue started to be a major factor, I doubted that that scenario would make economic sense. It, it just didn't pencil out, but it is something I think we need to be wary of now. Uh, and I do think it can be controlled by crafting the right carbon methodologies as it relates to sourcing of sustainable feedstock. This is an outdated graphic that I put together about five years ago, and I, I did it to describe the evolution of markets for biochar. It attempted to describe the uh, volume uh, or size of a marketplace, what the price point would be, and what the readiness was. Um, up at the top left there, I've added some of the more uh, recent uh, categories. We, as an industry, started focusing on the lower left here, mostly as it's used in soils, especially for farmers. But when you think about the early stages of any industry, when the prices are highest and adoption usually comes from the daring few, this might not have been the greatest uh, market to focus on as farmers are largely conservative and aren't known for adding a lot of money to spend on new shiny things, or in this case, select things. Uh, I will say though that we are starting to see a lot more farmers testing biochar in larger volumes, especially in places that have some significant growing constraints. Think of California with the water challenges, or in many parts of the world, they have toxic soils and biochar can help immobilize those toxins. This is one of the key areas of focus in China. So biochar producers have started to look for additional markets that are less seasonal and, and more repeatable, which includes things like filtration. And it also includes livestock feed. Um, this is probably one of the biggest markets over in Europe. And the benefit of adding biochar to feed is that it, it acts as a carbon delivery system to get the biochar into the soil. And at the same time, it's been found to help improve the health of uh, the animal um, in some cases, it's improving the quality and the quantity of the milk produced in, in dairy animals, and it can help reduce certain greenhouse gas emissions in manures. I will say that the FDA currently does not allow biochar to be included in animal feed in the U.S., and many people in the industry are uh, looking into this. I'm hopeful that this will be a high priority in the Biden uh, administration. But that said, California recently included it as something that can be included. Those are very specific biochars. They have to be made from a specific kind of feedstock, but it's a, it's a great first step. Um, in the US, I would say right now, the largest purchaser of biochar is compost. Although there's a big focus right now in putting it in different kinds of building materials. This is something that at the time I, I originally put this together, it wasn't quite ready, but it is being deployed already in Asia and specifically in Australia, where a company is claiming they put up to 30 tons of biochar per kilometer of road. So that not only creates an excellent carbon sink opportunity, but it does improve certain um, aspects of asphalt's performance. So 
most people really are uh, intrigued by the ability of biochar to sequester carbon safely and beneficially. But as we know, not everybody has, has uh, a comfort level with the discussion on climate change. So there's there's just so many different ways to talk about biochar. And what this chart is attempting to do is look at it within the context of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I don't have enough time to go into all of these, but if climate change is, is not something that a farmer wants to talk about, which I've found often, you can also talk about it in the context of how it can improve water quality by holding on to nutrients so they don't um, pollute the local water bodies, or you can talk about it in terms of farmer resilience. The last thing I wanted to talk about was um, biochar's interaction with the carbon markets, uh, which really, there was a lot of effort put in several years ago to get a methodology accepted on the California exchange, and it all just kind of came to nothing. Two years ago, when the IPCC highlighted biochar as one of just you know, a few negative emissions technologies, things really started to change. And last year, for the first time, a voluntary carbon market called Puro, which is based in Finland, selected biochar and two other removal products to test uh, in their carbon removal auctions. And the most recent transaction that I've heard about as it relates to biochar on the Puro market uh, is a company in Australia that has a biochar production unit in a greenhouse and they take waste wood, turn it into biochar, the heat goes into the greenhouse and the biochar is um, taken back by the provider of the wood and blended into their compost. And in this situation, they are getting 61 euros per ton of CO2, which in this case, the multiplier is about 2.88. So that converts to roughly $200 per ton of bio, dry biochar. And that's really gonna change things. This year, we saw the debut of another uh, voluntary marketplace, which is a blockchain-based uh, market very focused on biochar called Carbon Future. Uh, they're out of Europe, but they're also looking at US producers. And uh, next year, I know we will be looking at a lot more. Uh, Vera is, is one of the better known marketplaces and they are very interested in developing a biochar methodology. So that's where I was gonna end. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kathleen. That was fascinating. And we have a bunch of questions rolling in. Uh, but thanks for giving us that overview of the market and some of the considerations for how bio, biochar as an industry um, has evolved and could evolve into the future. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm getting some, some questions rolling in already. So uh, I would encourage the participants to go ahead and submit your questions through the Q&A tab. And uh, I'll begin kicking a few of them over to our, our two panelists. So first of all, um, for Johannes, um, a question comes in that says, please offer a reflection on the changing reception for biochar in this century. <laughs> um, for example, over 10 years ago, there were warnings and skepticism in the press, uh, including in The Guardian, um, how have these been addressed through research since that time? And how has the perception perhaps changed in sort of the public sphere? And then as you might reflect on the changing reception of biochar, um, could you talk a little bit about how research has helped to accomplish that goal? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a big a question, point. but uh, yeah. Yeah, well, and now we can start to look back on, on quite a few years. Um, and. Uh, no, a lot of the, the questions are good questions that we should always ask um, uh, and, uh, and, and um, weigh carefully uh, the answers and um, uh, look at what needs to be addressed, what kind of research agenda items emanate from such concerns. Um, and I think that uh, that has largely happened within the confines of research uh, uh, funding limitations, as well as, I would say, um, limitations of implementation and therefore research 
at scale of implementation. So that there are still um, major agenda items. Um, but uh, you know, one, of, one of the big um, cornerstones, as, as I pointed out in, in my brief talk, is um, to uh, that, that biochar is more persistent than the material you make it from. Um, that is, is very, you no, know, that's, that's sort of the, the alpha and omega of, of the whole spiel. Um, because if it, it, if it doesn't persist longer in soil, um, then much of at least half of the emission reductions fall away. Um, and of course, the persistence of any uh, soil improvement and therefore a greater crop growth or, or other um, ancillary effects fall away. Uh, so that uh, obviously, if you want to prove um, that a material has a mean residence time, uh, of hundreds to thousands of years, you cannot provide this conclusively within a year, right? Um, it's, it's very, you, you need to wait a little bit until you can actually prove that something decomposes slower than something else. Um, so on day one, you, you don't know that. Although there are uh, ample, um, ample natural analogs, and, and, but also that takes time to, to unravel all of that. So the last 10, 15 years, there have been a plethora of, of studies that looked uh, natural analogs or how is, how is biochar type carbon cycling uh, in the environment, um, uh, doing balances uh, for the earth system, how much biochar type material do we have in, in global soils and, and how much goes in and, and calculate um, uh, mean residence times from that, uh, as well as doing uh, dedicated analysis of adding biochar somewhere and then waiting five years or 10 years and then seeing how much is still there. Uh, obviously, you, know, you need to wait 10 years until you know how much is there out of the 10 years. And, and, and those things are, are now possible. Um, and uh, and, and uh, you know, that, that's also the reason why there is now a, a biochar methodology in the uh, IPCC in National Greenhouse Gas um, uh, um, methodology that nations can now use this IPCC method that was published last year um, because we have now a sufficient number of, of uh, data points to put that. We can always do better and we don't know it for all uh, possible biochar combinations, but it's enough to get us in the neighborhood and be conservative about assumptions uh, and still um, uh, have a, a viable pro proposition in, in terms of um, uh, the, the expected um, uh, permanence over a hundred years. Um, uh, so that's that's um, that's certainly. But I, I would say, um, as I said just in, at the beginning of this response, uh, there are not enough uh, farmer implementation and um, large scale conversions uh, that we can do all the the, the necessary uh, large scale um, uh, systems types analysis um, that we would like to do. So there are some intermediate steps that need to be done, but they they really require engagement by uh, by the industry and um, and municipalities and um, uh, and governments to to implement those so that we can see how they work uh, and and how, what the economics are, how the acceptance is. Um, that there there will be a lot of details to be ironed out. That, that was going to be one of my follow-up questions, actually, is um, what seems to be the bottleneck uh, on the research side, uh, if you could think about, is it not enough labs working on this in a very controlled space? Is it not enough, uh, not enough opportunities in sort of an experimental field setting, or is it like... Well, you're asking a scientist who wants to have more money for research. I'm, I'm, I'm saying yes. Um, uh, so that's, that's but a which scientists answer. should have more, um, yeah, exactly. and which types of of experiments or studies um, are sort of the most important right now? Because yeah, they're no, that's uh, and and uh, Kathleen knows probably even more than I do. But from the science side, uh, I'll just quickly mention uh, uh, from the science side, there's there's quite a number of. Um, uh, labs around the world that are engaging in biochar science and research uh, on the fundamental side as well as some of the applied side. So, so I would say this is the, the, the number of research activity is, is in biochar is by far outstripping the, uh, the, the activity in compost science, for instance, already for many years. Uh, so if you take that as a, as a benchmark, uh, so per unit year, um, we're, we're getting more information about biochar these days uh, than about uh, composting. Uh, so that's uh, that tells you that, that we're catching up. Um, we've, 
uh, know a lot more of, uh, about compost uh, <laughs> than, than we do about biochar, but, but uh, it's catching up quickly. Um, but indeed, more of the, the um, uh, mac uh, business economics and industrial application side, um, farmer acceptance uh, and adoption, disadoption side, sort of the, the scale, the, the experimentation and, and the, the hard research at scale of implementation. That's probably the, the next big agenda item. Okay. I want to add to that, that one of the things we need on the research side is a better understanding of what particular characteristics of biochar are relevant to different end uses. We sort of have more knowledge of that on the soil side, but as biochar is moving into these different end uses, we still don't know what it is that constitutes a good biochar for use in, you know, concrete or filtration to filter specific types mm -hmm. of heavy metals or other toxins. So it'd be great to have more research on that. I wonder, Kathleen, if you could talk a little bit about um, just in terms of soil application or soil amendment, it seems that there's quite a bit of variation and there's also variation in the types of biochar. And I wonder if you, if you could say something about the different factors that affect those outcomes and you're sort of talking about, as I understand it, kind of matchmaking, right? Like matching up the right biochar with the right conditions. Um, how do we understand how to move forward in that space? Oh, I defer that definitely to you. Okay. <laughs> he knows much better about that than I do. Yeah. Um, I mean, th this, there's definitely a lot that we need to still know about it. There, um, some of it is, is blatantly obvious uh, and, and it's, it can be tackled with basic agronomy that we keep forgetting um, when mm. we're discussing this, uh, but that every farmer knows and uh, and and so there, there's a lot that we do know um, and um, be, be it for instance lime equivalents um, uh, uh, every farmer knows about a pH and and uh, whether he or she needs to put lime on or not uh, so that you know, we're, we're getting very close um, to, to a recommendation system in that uh, respect. But then there are a, a lot of others where we know very little. And, and actually it's the same with compost um, or, or any other amendment. It's also shocking how, how little we know about uh, fertilizer response, night, plain nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, many countries have one fertilizer recommendation for the whole country. Um, so so it, it's not a unique uh, challenge. It's just a new challenge that comes to all the other challenges that we already had. Um, and so we need these, these um, uh, recommendations, uh, which type of biochar to add where. The, the ch challenge is, of course, that uh, maybe also communication that when we talk about nitrogen, we know that it's nitrogen. When we talk about biochar, it can, can be almost anything in the world. So we, we do need to pay attention that the word biochar implies, uh, you know, gives a certain framework, but, but within that cloud, um, there, there's something that could be ha have a pH of three or 12 uh, mm -hmm. that could have no nitrogen or a lot of nitrogen. Um, so so we, we do need to cater for all of that. Um, I do have uh, particular interest in, in some of the uh, 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 esoteric effects on, on uh, uh, plant, plant and plant micro communication aspects and and i think you know when, when we start um uh, looking at at uh, the 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 rhizosphere ecology uh, of plants um uh, we we will as as everybody else who's not all, also in, in in biochar is discovering that that's so important um uh, that uh, there are specific effects that might still surprise us so i, th I think there are some some uh, some properties in in terms of conductivities and and uh, pores and surface properties uh, that we haven't really have had a chance to translate into something that a farmer or a user uh, can actually um, uh, decipher and, and translate into something that goes on a label that, um, that uh, mm -hmm. translates into, in, into an adoption. Uh, so I think there's, there's quite a bit of discovery still to be done, but what, what we have um, uh, in, in terms of, of 
can it can, can it uh, replace lime long long lasting lime or slow release uh, nitrogen properties and so on we have enough um, for moving forward and and products on the marketplace that seem to deliver some of that already uh, so it's it's not uh, only in the research domain of 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 a wedge uh, of those um, of those uh, projected uh, properties, um, but they're highly variable, and and it's good to look under the hood um, uh, of of all of that. It's still it's still a fast moving train, um, and uh, so we will. It's good to be vigilant and uh, and uh, and know something about it. That's 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 great. Um, I want to circle back to Kathleen again, though. Uh, I want to. There's a few questions coming in. Um, they touch on the topic of sort of recognition, both in the context of some of these standards. Um, so one question is about, you know, why haven't the gold standard and Vera and at a higher level the UNFCCC uh, acknowledged biochar as an instrument? Um, and then also there are questions about, you know, what kinds of outreach or kind of public relations? What do we need to get this? more widely acknowledged in the public sphere and sort of in a mainstream way, uh, and maybe among some of the potential end users of biochar. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about either of those two topics? Yeah, I'll take the second one first. So one of the uh, best impacts of the USDA NRCS adopting this code 808 that I mentioned, at least in New York State, from what I've heard, what they did is they trained all their uh, agents to uh, learn how biochar is produced, how it should be added to soils and things like that. So that there is this, this notion of biochar is coming from a respected body of individuals and not just us in the industry saying, you gotta try this. So that alone is, is worth a lot. And if we could get more organizations like that to trial it and, and promote it, I think that would be great. Um, going back to the, the first question, it, it's really interesting. I know Johannes has had several conversations with Vera, as have I, and the question has, has been a little bit um, hung up on getting funding to, to get these methodologies developed, but we should actually know by the end of this week if we have some funding to, to put that in motion. They are very, very interested in getting it developed, and the conversations we've been having are are not just let's get it done, but how would that look? Who's gonna benefit from that? Is it just the producer? Can it be the person putting the, the biochar in the ground? Um, so there's, it's, it's, a, it's a big question, but I think there's a lot of enthusiasm. Just today, in fact, I got notified by a very large um, oil and gas company that's very interested in biochar as a carbon removal product. So I, the, the interest is there, the, the people that uh, we're putting together a coalition of methodology developers, project developers that um, you know, will help move this to the next step. But I, I predict with a high degree of confidence that we'll see something on, on uh, one of those exchanges next year. Okay. Um Assuming that, that that works out, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the potential for scaling up? How, how big could this get? How, how far could it go? Um, Johannes, if you want to talk about some of your work in the tropics and maybe some of the barriers to deployment in those contexts, that might be helpful, but I'll open this up to both of you. Kathleen, why don't you start? Yeah, so the question of scalability is is going to be very interesting. I, just last night, I was talking to Tom Miles, who's the head of the U.S. Biochar Initiative, and he uh, was talking to the U.S. Forest Service, which is very interested in biochar. They have a 10,000 acre property somewhere in the Midwest, which is also um, uh, co-hosting a, a mine that needs to be rehabilitated because there's asbestos there and the forestry service is interested in thinning it so that the the fire uh, risk is lowered and and that alone you know could constitute a huge carbon sink opportunity because it'll be using waste resources and solving a problem beyond sequestration uh, that that needs to be solved economically so you know when you think of those kind of large-scale opportunities uh, and that's just woody biomass I think it's it will be easy to scale if we figure this out properly can it be abused yes and and I think that's where we need to to focus the most energy on making sure the feedstock is coming from 
non-agricultural soils that are converted for that purpose. Um, so yeah, there's challenges, but we have so much unwanted biomass out there, not just woody, but we're now seeing an increased interest in converting sewage sludge. There's a huge plant opening in New Jersey next year that's taking in 440 tons of sewage sludge and converting it into, you know, biochar. It's, it's not a lot, five or 10 percent, but still that's, that's a great use of a resource that causes problems if it's, you know, put on farmland. So yeah, I think, I think we're going to see a big uptick in the next couple of years. Yeah, any, any CDR with, with biomass or soils um, involving agriculture uh, is, is by definition a distributed um, opportunity and a distributed challenge. Uh, no, this is this, this it, it shares the challenges with thinking about soil carbon sequestration in general. It just has to, to scale to, to a petagram number um, globally, it needs to be happening on many, many soils and uh, soil carbon sequestration and biochar would need to have, be happening um, in, in many, many places. Um, so scaling that up is, is uh, by definition a challenge. If, if, if we think about um, uh, wind energy or, or photovoltaics and, and the 50s and 60s, um, oh, we, we might have had um, optimism in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s that photovoltaic will, will satisfy our, our electrical energy needs um, within years and, and the, well, certainly the potential. And now we're 50 years later, uh, we're starting to put in the US the first um, photovoltaics, at least in our area here on our, our, our houses. Um, so it, it took 40, 50 years until from saying, oh, here's the technology, let's get cracking, um, to, well, is this a, everything in place and is the technology there and do we have the incentive structure and are people interested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so does it, will take another 50 years until it has some kind of penetration, so like, no, no, starting to get into the double digits, so 10% of, of what it could do? Um, you know, I don't know, um, but um, it's our track record in, in, in spinning out um, uh, wind energy and photovoltaics in, in the U.S. is not great. Um, if it's on the same pathway penetration, then yeah, we'll, we'll take another 50 years until we'll see it happening in earnest. Um, but, uh, but maybe we're also better now. We, we, we see the urgency. Um, uh, and I would say it, it's... Um, it's it's an avenue that uh, could have also a, a back end incentive that that uh, farmers uh, and and that is where I think we have to put the focus on the farmer, not just on the front end uh, biomass. Um, uh, no farmer or land use manager will put that in the soil if it doesn't support what that farmer does every day. That farmer is a chicken farmer or a, a dairy farmer or a uh, or a corn farmer, it needs to improve corn growing or some, some of the core, core uh, enterprise of, of that farmer. Um, and, and if it doesn't do that, that, that corn farmer is probably not gonna, gonna be a, a methane farmer or, or a carbon, uh, carbon farmer only. That farmer is still a poultry or, or dairy or a corn farmer. Uh, and, and, and so, so but this, this, this end stage incentive, um, or the back end inst incentive, that if that's happening, that can that can create a pull also uh, that maybe some of the photovoltaics didn't have. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but on the other hand, um, having a lot of moving parts and a lot of winds that in 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 theory are beautiful if they all come together also means that you no know, maybe they have to come together to create a, a socially and an economically viable package and. And if you have lots of moving parts, um, it's getting notoriously more difficult to optimize at a given location, but you also have more options to optimize. So, so it, it's, it's really a, a balance. I, I think we'll, we'll have to take it one step at a time uh, and, and move this forward um, where the benefits, especially the, the front and the end uh, benefits are blatantly obvious when we're, we're, we're taking care of an environmental issue on the front end um, and we're creating value in the soil or somewhere else um, at, at the back end. If, and if that comes together at its location X, then, then we should start there. Um, and, and that will keep us busy for the next decade, I'm sure, uh, only to take care of those. I just wanted to say that in China, the estimates for biochar production are probably five times what they are in the US. 
um, though it's a little hard to verify that number, uh, but they're really ambitious about it. And uh, they just published a paper recently in China where they estimated that if they went full scale, they could probably uh, sequester the equivalent of 15% of their greenhouse gas emissions in China. And some people think that might be a conservative number because it didn't take into account, you know, reduction in methane or, or nitrous oxide. So that's not a bad That would number. be a huge deal uh, for the world's largest emitting country at this point. Um, so that's quite amazing. And that's a significant scale um, on the order of what the entire uh, terrestrial sink provides to the U.S. In, in, uh, relative to its scale of emissions. So that's that would be an enormous thing. Um, we are approaching time, uh, or actually a little bit past it, and we still have lots of questions rolling in. So I hope that uh, those will be captured by our hosts um, and they'll be available for people to refer to in the future. And I encourage people participating in this webinar um, to follow up uh, and see if we can learn more from our, our two speakers and uh, through the Institute itself, which I, I expect will be providing more information on this topic. Uh, and especially as those new findings roll out uh, that you described, Johannes, over the next decade, hopefully we'll have the chance to check in sooner than that to see how things are going. Um, I also wanna mention that you know a number of, of people who submitted questions uh, were expressing some concerns about the potential for this to sort of create perverse outcomes. Um, and I know that that's, that's on everyone's mind with all of these CDR technologies. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, it sounds like the two of you are optimistic that we can do this in a safe way that provides some real benefits without um, going down those perverse paths. And so uh, I think we'll all be keeping an eye on that and hoping that that's the case and doing what we can. It also sounds like there's possibly an opportunity for this to move forward in a more accelerated way uh, because of the interest that's been expressed by um, the Biden transition team. So we'll see where that ends up as well. With that, uh, unless there's anything else that uh, comes through from our, our hosts, I think uh, I'll go ahead and wrap things up here. Uh, thank you to everyone for your interest and participation. Thank you to our two speakers, Kathleen and Johannes, for sharing your, your insights and wisdom. And I uh, look forward to hearing more and hearing more from the Institute about uh, other topics related to carbon dioxide removal. So thanks everyone. And thank you very much. See you. See you next time.